We were reading tonight about the right to repair movement. Turns out that a lot of corporations are making it impossible to repair the things you bought from them, unless you send them back to the corporation. And there are a lot of people complaining about that. And it made me think. The Buddha's approach to the mind is that you have the right to repair your mind. A lot of people out there who say, no, somebody else has to do this for you. But he's saying, no. You've got the wherewithal within yourself to solve the mind's problems, particularly the problem of suffering. And the Four Noble Truths are like his repair manual, because they're things you, you can find within yourself. They're right here, right now, all Four Truths. And the reason we haven't seen them is that some of them are very subtle, and some of them go against the grain. But if you make up your mind that you really do want to solve the problem of suffering, everything you need is right here. You've got all the tools. The first noble truth is the truth basically that all forms of suffering can be reduced to clinging. That's usually the last thing we look at when we're suffering from something. We focus on the pain, how much we don't like the pain. We want somebody to do something to take care of it. And we tend to blame the problem on something outside. That's why we hope for the solution to come from outside. But as the Buddha said, this, the problem comes from within, and you can solve it from within. Just learning how to recognize every time there's an instance of suffering in the mind, whether it's over birth, aging, illness, death, separation from those you love, being with people you don't like, not getting what you want. In every case, it's clinging, finding passion and delight in something, which means that even in suffering there's kind of an allure. There's something in there that makes you go for it. The problem is we don't see the connection between the cause and the, and the actual suffering, which is why we keep going again and again and again. The second noble truth is the fact of cl clinging comes from craving, craving for becoming, craving for sensuality, craving for no becoming. Notice that's not every form of desire. There are other desires that are actually part of the path to the end of suffering, but these three ones are the ones that actually lead to the clinging that's going to be suffering. And again, we very rarely look at the craving as a problem. We tend to like our cravings. We like our desires. This is one of the reasons why these truths are said to be noble, is they go against the grain. The other reason they're noble is because they're part of a noble search. As the Buddha said, there are two kinds of searches in life. There's the search for things that can age and grow ill and die, and then there's the search for things that don't age, don't grow ill, don't die. The first search is the ignoble search, and the second one is the noble search. And the noble truths are truths that help with that noble search. The third noble truth, the cessation of suffering, is basically the end of all passion for craving. Even your nostalgia for craving of the past, you have to let go of that. And you do that with the Fourth Noble Truth, which is the Eightfold Path. Now each of these truths carries a duty. This is why they're part of the repair kit. It kind of maps out, this is what the problem is like, and this is what you've got to do. You've got to comprehend the suffering. It means learn how to develop some dispassion for whatever it is that attracts you to do the things, that cling to things, that will actually make you suffer. The duty with regard to the cause of suffering is to abandon it. If you see it coming, arising, you let it go. The duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth is to realize it, to verify it for yourself that this actually does happen. You can let go of craving. And the duty with regard to the Fourth Noble Truth is to develop it. 
the qualities, everything from right view all the way through right concentration. You don't just watch these things arise and pass away. If there's anything you can do to give rise to them, you do. Anything that's getting in the way of their getting rise, <clears throat> getting in the way of their developing, you've got to abandon it. So there's work to be done. Now notice the Buddha sets these things out in very broad patterns. And one of the skills of meditation is learning how to apply that pattern to your experience. This requires that you be observant. Because to see the clinging in your suffering requires that you be very perceptive. And also to see where there's craving that you may not have noticed before. And as for the potentials, all the good things in the path, those require subtle discernment as well. Sometimes concentration starts out very, very small. And it doesn't seem like much, and so you snuff it out. You want something better to come along. It's like every time a little seed begins to sprout, even though it is a seed for a large tree, you say, this is not a large tree, this is just a little sprout, and you pull it out. There's no way you're going to get the large tree unless you allow the sprout to grow and encourage it to grow. So all this requires that you be very observant. This is one of the reasons why in the forest tradition the teachers don't teach everything. And John Fuhrman told me when I went back to ordain, he said, don't expect that everything is going to be handed to you on a platter. As a meditator, you have to learn how to think like a thief. The thief is planning to rob a house. He doesn't go up and ask the owners, where do you keep your valuables? When are you going to be away so I can have a nice convenient time getting in your house and stealing your stuff? He has to observe on his own. When do the owners leave? When do they stay? What part of the house do they seem to be especially protective of? And it's through being observant that you get what you want. Of course, that's a, it's an unskillful example, but it is an example of how you have to think as a meditator. You can't expect the teacher to explain everything. After all, things come up in your meditation, the teacher's not going to be right there. In some problems, you don't want to wait until the 5, 5 p.m. question and answer session. You want to solve the problem right then. So you've got to learn to use your powers of observation. And with the John Fuhr, my duty eventually came to be the person who cleaned his hut. And he didn't tell me where things had to be put. I had to observe on my own. If I put things in the wrong places, sometimes he'd throw them. Not at me, but he'd throw them someplace else to indicate that that's not where they should be. He never would tell me where the right places were, but he'd just let me know, okay, you've got to be more observant. Sometimes he would give me tasks without really explaining the task very well. I'd have to figure it out on my own. I had to figure out one, one time how to make a stove for the dying shed out of termite dirt. He never explained to me where termite dirt was. I had to find it myself. So always bear this in mind, that if you really want to get the most out of the practice, there are a lot of things you're going to have to observe for yourself. And your willingness to observe is a sign of your, your desire to learn. If you say, I'm only going to learn the things that I'm taught, it's like those, the kids in school who want to have an exam only on the things that they were taught in the classroom which in a classroom may be okay, but in real life it's not the way things work. Sometimes you're going to be tested for things you didn't expect. You're going to be judged on areas that you didn't expect you'd be judged. And this principle goes into the mind as well. There are certain forms of craving that are not going to let, make it easy for you to abandon them. Certain forms of clinging that are going to be easier for you to comprehend. And nobody can stand there in your mind and say, look, right here, right here, right here. 
This is one of the reasons when you get the mind concentrated, the kind of concentration you want is all around. You're fully aware of the body, fully aware all around. Because a lot of the clingings and cravings of the mind, they hide behind the scenes. You're looking in one direction and they, they're, <clears throat> they're behind your eyeballs. So you have to learn how not to look just in one direction. It's like the story they tell about the, the cannons that the British used to defend Singapore. They thought if the J Japanese attacked Singapore, they were going to come from the sea, so they set the cannons in concrete, pointed out to the sea. And then it turned out that the Japanese came down the Malay Peninsula, and the cannons were useless. As we're working on concentration here, you're trying to bring your awareness to fill the body and try to fill the body with a sense of pleasure. You've got body, feeling, mind, all right here. And you make that awareness all around. When you're sitting here, try not to bring into the concentration the perception you have that you're facing forward. Your eyes may be facing forward. And we live in a world where we think that we're facing in one direction, and we tend to carry that perception into the mind, that the mind is facing in one direction, too. But as soon as you close your eyes and focus on the body, try to make your awareness omnidirectional. You're looking in all directions. This is why they call the Buddha an all-around eye. He saw things in his mind, he saw things in his body that people before him hadn't seen, things that were right there, but things that people looked past. So if you're going to repair your mind, you take the general instructions that the Buddha gave to give you an idea of what to look for. But as to whether or not you're really going to see it yourself, that depends on your own powers of observation. What he asked for, he said, bring me a student who's observant and is not a deceiver. In other words, he wanted someone who was honest and observant. And I'll teach that person the Dharma. Those are the two qualities you want to bring into the practice. You can take the Buddhist repair manual and you can actually make good use of it, developing your own skill as a repair person. <laughs>